Hello and uh, welcome to the video. This is for makeup participation in my small group uh, communication class. Um, I'm here to just talk about a couple things. And the, the participation part is you can just answer the question at the end and that's that's all you do. Um, this makeup uh, participation, I decided to do it this way because we had such a shortened class um, a week ago when we were talking about theories in um, our, our group communication course, uh, the theories I wanted to introduce. And so I barely touched upon those theories and I felt it was widely uh, very appropriate if I go back and talk about it here. And um, I'm gonna recommend everyone watch the video, but um, if you feel like you're missing participation points because you missed the day in class or you weren't contributing on a certain day or whatever, make sure you go down to um, the replies and post your answer to the question. Okay, uh, so let's get started. Now, uh, this is for um, social science uh, communication study theories that I'm introducing to you right now and how they relate to group communication. Um, just like before, anytime I, um, our, our book for the course is small and so, as you are well aware that I introduced new terms and stuff that's not in the book. And so make sure you write it down, make sure you write the terms down, which we already did in class. And um, just like before, the theories that I'm gonna use, I'm gonna get the definition directly from Google because since it's not from the book and I don't want you to go out and buy other books or buy other, or track things down, I just use simple Google definition. Um, you'll also find these terms also in our slides in on pages and so forth. So just be aware of that. So let's get into it. These are the four theories, um, social science and communication studies theories that I'm gonna bring in to group communication and why they're relevant to group communication. All right, so let's get started. Now, uh, again, and when you look at these definitions, they're going to tell you where these things tend to lie in psychology, um, interpersonal, um, stuff like that. Um, but the fact of the matter is that these are important for group communication. So the very first one is cognitive dissonance. This is actually a very widely recognized um, theory in um, communication studies. I teach it in public speaking. I have taught it in interpersonal and so forth. Um, and it's a simple idea. And you can see in the definition, again, remember, since it's not in the book and I'm introducing it to you, I'm only going to be requiring that you look up a simple Google search. Um, and make sure when you do these searches, uh, write out the whole term. Um, in the field of psychology, a cognitive dissonance, this is the important part, occurs when a person holds contradictory beliefs, ideas, or values in a typical experience of psychological stress when they participate in an action that goes against one of them. It's a simple idea of when you hear information and it causes discomfort. It can be psychological stress. Um, it could be physiological because the fact of the matter is the idea that you feel butterflies in your stomach or anxiety or, or stuff like that. Um, and we've all had that in some way or another. You hear information you don't like and it causes stress, it causes anxiety and so forth. In group communicate, in, in communication studies, this is very important because especially nowadays with uh, the information that is out there. And we, we see that in everyday, in our everyday society now. Um, you know, I, I point out the January 6th, um, insurrection on the Capitol. Um, here was a group of people who acted out uh, there because they heard information they, they didn't accept. This is That's an extreme example, but you can see how the gamut from simple butterflies in your stomach to doing an absolutely um, um, radical um, thing. So this is a thing in everyday society now where we feel discomfort or, or you're communicating with someone and they feel discomfort because they're hearing information that goes against their belief system or their ideas or values. Now, why is this important in group communication? In group communication, you are dealing with multiple people. 
And from that, there's going to be multiple perspectives. And so you are getting information and you're giving information to um, uh, multiple receivers. There are multiple sources, multiple receivers. And in that dynamic, you can have different individuals in the group who might feel discomfort. And you might have to deal with that discomfort in the group communication setting. It's a simple idea of your friend group and you go out and you want to go out and someone doesn't like the choice that you guys had as friend as in the friend group of where you're going to go eat because they're the vegetarian or they're vegan or they had a dietary requirements and that restaurant doesn't really help them. And so they feel discomfort or anxiety that they're not going to be able to really eat anything there. Um, I, that's a simple idea, but this becomes, you have to deal with that in the group communication setting. You have to deal in that moment or in the overall issue with someone's cognitive dissonance on finding out information. It goes into organization communication. Uh, when you're talking about issues in a work environment and they so one person in the in the group in the meeting represents a department and the information that comes out goes against what the department wants their values and so forth so it's important to remember that cognitive dissidence um, is important in group communication because the group communication the practices the methods the norms whatever you want to call them what's going on in the group communication can be affected by some and an individual's cognitive dissonance. And by the way, the whole group can feel it too, because it's just like if um, if somebody uh, is a group of high school students who are in an academic event and they find out they lose, or they find out that they didn't cover the, the rules properly or someone and they have rulings against them, the whole group can feel that at the same time in a collective manner if they you find distressing news or the overall group goal of the group communication. All right, so this is why it's important. And you can see by talking about this, saying this out loud, you can possibly write it in your end of semester uh, paper, um, how you can maybe talk about it in one of your main points or something like that on your famous meeting where someone was getting bad news and they didn't like it. Social penetration theory better known as the onion theory. A theory proposes that as a relationship develops, interpersonal communication moves from relatively shadow to non-intimate levels to more deeper and intimate uh, um, open, uh, I think this is what it says there. <laughs> but the thing that you must understand, we always like to call it the onion theory, is that the more connected you feel in the moment or with the individual, the more you reveal, the farther down the, um, it, um, the onion theory is the more you peel layers off the onion and get deeper into the core. That's more revealing. Um, and this is a, a social science theory that's very popular in interpersonal, but I actually, I like it for intercultural. It's one of the theories I teach in intercultural because it was taught to me by one of the um, best intercultural professors, you know, one of the, the leaders in that field. Because uh, he's old. <laughs> Don't tell him I said that. Anyways, uh, but the fact of the matter is, it's an important part of communication. Um, it is it, it's how the person sees the interaction and what they're willing to reveal. And sometimes people tend to reveal more uh, when they want to get more out of the situation. Okay. That's why you get those awkward situations like with a stranger that reveals too much because they either want something dramatically from you or that that's the that's our um that's their go-to in communication but this is important for group communication um because again when you have the different components when you have the different individuals and it's the, the different source and the receivers and so forth uh, what you decide to encode in your communication um, is how you you what you want to reveal about yourself or the situation to get cooperation amongst the group. It's when people disclose stuff in that group setting because they want the group to either accept what they have to say 
or maybe you feel confident in what the person is saying is relevant. So for example, going to the simple idea of going with your friends out to a place of dinner is the simple thing, well, I've been to that restaurant. You know, the number four is the best um, meal on the menu because I've been there. It's you're, you're revealing something. Or if you don't want to go there and you reveal that you had a bad experience, I don't want to go there because uh, that's where I got dumped on Valentine's Day in a very horrible dinner, which by the way, I use an example because I know somebody who actually did that to somebody on Valentine's Day. They dumped them at a dinner on Valentine's Day. And to this day, I will always say how horrible that person is for doing something like that. And that wasn't me, by the way. I was, that was somebody I know that experienced that. Anyways, um, it's important to, for you to understand that when we're in that group setting and group communication setting, uh, we might tend to reveal more or, you know, go over that layers and the onions or what you are, think is appropriate for the uh, setting for the overall group goal or maybe your own goals within the group communication. And so it becomes a device. It becomes a, 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 something that can be utilized is when it comes to social penetration theory is uh, what you're willing to reveal to get the overall communication success of the group. All right, so it's a very important thing that can take, a, and again, famous meeting for your group um, uh, project at the end of the semester. Um, maybe one or two of the people there had to reveal stuff um, um, to kind of connect with other members of that group. All right, let's go into standpoint theory. This is probably the most complicated theory. Um, I was choosing this or, um, I can't, why I can't think of it right now. Um, um, anyways, it's, um, I was thinking about different ones, but I, I like standpoint theory here because of how it was actually used on me in a class I had took one time, um, a graduate course I took at Cal State LA, but we'll get into that in a second. So standpoint theory or standpoint epistemology is a theory found in some academic disciplines, blah, 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 used for analyzing intersubject discourses. The body of the work proposes that the authority is rooted in the individual's knowledge and the source of the authority it exerts. It's the, pers it's, the best way to understand it is perspective. Pers um, it is the idea that uh, a person's knowledge and what they bring to the table um, is, is uh, associated with their uh, status in, in society. Um, it's the, the power, the authority that they exert and some of the definitions there. Um, <laughs> it's the idea that yeah, individual's knowledge is connected to their um, social status or, or setting. Um, it's the perspective they also bring as well. Um, why can't I think of the other theory that I, I like a lot and I teach it in uh, different courses that it's not important, but what is important is how standpoint theory works in group communication settings. Um, there's a lot of depth to this theory and you can get lost into it, but it's a simple idea that the individuals in that group represent not only their perspective in the idea of standpoint theory, but also um, the perception people in the group have of that individual by the association with their status in society. So the reason why I use this theory is how um, I was in a graduate course at Cal State LA and the professor um, would, cause they, there's levels and in individuals. So the higher level you are, the, the, the different demographics come together and you, you um, it's like ranked. And so they ranked and I was the only white male uh, in the class. And so they would every, almost every time the professor would call me number one uh, because I was the highest order um, when it came to my perspective and social status and so forth as a white, with white cis male, I was, I was told constantly. And the reason why that is important is in group communication, we can make judgment on who's talking and so forth by our own perception of where they stand in our society. 
Um, I use the example when I teach intercultural, when I have a chance to teach intercultural, I should say, uh, about uh, the different, the observations I had with um, growing up around the Asian American community. I live in one, in a heavy Asian American community now in Alhambra, but I grew up next to, uh, around one in Fresno with the Hmong, um, Hmong Americans. And the reason why I say that is because growing up with the friends that I did in the different group and, and talking with different um, Asian Americans and, and the magnet school I went to, I found out that there was a hierarchy there and how they, and the treatment of individuals within different communities and so forth. And um, it was fascinating to me years later to look back on that time and realize what was there. And the idea is when these individuals would get together, maybe the idea of who's number one in the group can actually affect how group communication works or occurs or so forth. It can talk about the dis decision making, be in leadership, the different perspective and the connection with the society status can actually affect the overall group and so forth. So that's why it's a possible thing to talk about. Um, why can I think about interdependence? Uh, oh, I'll, oh, and inter intersectionality. Um, I'm probably butchering it now, but anyways, I use standpoint theory over that one because I think standpoint theory, the other one is what an individual brings to the group. While I think standpoint theory, there's a, a bit of judgment um, on individuals when they look at um, other group members. That's why I introduced that idea. The idea of hierarchy and standpoint theory kind of talks about that uh, in a bit in the group due to social status and stuff. And finally, the last one is knowledge gap and knowledge gap theory. And this is very important in everyday society now as the hypothesis explains the knowledge like other forms of wealth is often uh, differently distributed through a social system. It just means that there's a gap of knowledge between people in a higher echelon in society versus uh, lower echelons. It's the idea of the wealthy have more access to information and people who are poor have less access to information. And it also should be noted, I mean, there's a lot of things that need to be changed about this theory, because the fact of the matter is, uh, there is a lot of access to information now with the internet, but it's also what is considered reliable information. And better educated folks, hypothetically speaking, should recognize what is valid information compared to what is invalid information. Maybe they're less likely to be duped in, you know, misinformation, disinformation versus folks of a, a lower standing. And the reason why that's important is because in group communication, you're dealing with multiple perspectives and the knowledge gap can come into a factor because uh, some of the fact, some of the people in there might be coming from sources or parts of our society that either has access to less information, less reliable information, or maybe have disdain for um, information that goes against what they believe and so forth. So you have a, a, a natural gap in our society and that can affect group communication. Now, it is reasonable to state that groups tend to be in a mutual social status in the sense of your friends tend to come from the same neighborhood as you, your family's, you know, usually the same social status and so forth. What this really affects is our work environment. Now, if the work meeting is of individuals of the same work level, then that's one thing, but we have so many different levels with organizations and communication between departments and so forth, you can have that possibility. Um, right now we're dealing with COVID. We can have a bunch of people in, in the room that are educated, but then, um, and have maybe a background in science, but then you can get into another work meeting where you have different departments who have individuals who don't have a background in science. And so there's that lack of knowledge and that conflict and so forth that can come in from people who are, follow them different areas on the knowledge gap. So 
that can affect group communication. It can slow things down and so forth. In your famous meeting, um, it can be said that the knowledge gap in some such situations can be um, also who is experiencing certain things and who is not as well. There are lots of different things to go there and how you can connect these communication studies and social science theories, um, these two, uh, these into your um, writings for group communication. So that's why they introduced. And so what you're going to do for your makeup um, uh, participation points is a pretty simple one where you uh, take one of these theories and just maybe write an example of how it can connect to group communication. Something I didn't say, or maybe even a personal example where I'm like, oh yeah, this I was in this group and the knowledge gap or social penetration theory or cognitive dissonance or standpoint theory um, had a had a you know I could see it being help explain what happened in this moment. Nothing too elaborate, you know, like two three sentences. Nothing nothing too elaborate. All right, get to work. Oops, Let's see.